All right, it looks like the uh, the flow of folks has slowed down a little bit, so I think it's uh, about time to get started. Um, so welcome everyone to our talk uh, hosted by Tabular today. Um, we're going to be speaking about change data capture uh, in an iceberg lens. So how to get data into iceberg for change data capture and how to process it after the fact. And then we'll talk about a little bit about uh, you know what we do at Tabular um, to enable this to be uh, a smooth operation. Um, I'm Cliff Gilmore. I'm a principal solutions architect here at Tabular, working with our customers across the board. Uh, joining me is uh, Jason Reed, our co-founder at Tabular and head of product, who will do the second half of the presentation today. So just a little bit of, of context. Uh, we work with a lot of, of customers uh, and uh, community members of the Apache Iceberg community and uh, working on their data lakes. And one of the most common patterns that we see across all of our, our customers is that, and the users, is that uh, game change data capture into a data lake is a little bit harder than is some other systems. Um, it's not as simple as writing to a, a relational database or a non-relational database where you just do upserts all the time and things are easy. When you're dealing with files and analytical stores, um, it is significantly more, more challenging to get right and to make timely. Uh, what we've seen is that to get around that challenge traditionally, a lot of folks have done resorted to things like daily snapshots from their databases and other um, more uh, slow ETL processes to get data in. Um, what we're going to talk about today is how can you improve that? How you can you get your latency down to you know minute level resolution and 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 make that pipeline very performant, but also repeatable and correct. So that's kind of a, an overview. I always like to start out our webinars with, uh, you know, why Iceberg itself, because I think it's always important to talk about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm assuming that a vast majority of our audience today already knows what Iceberg is, but I think it's always important to reiterate. Um, so Apache Iceberg is a file format for a modern data lake. Its goal for existence is to improve a lot of the things that have traditionally been difficult when storing data in, in, um, in modern object stores. So the key things are the support for multiple engines, being able to have the same file format be written once and read across as many different uh, processors and engines and technologies as possible. Uh, the other things that are really important are giving you a SQL-like experience. So we want the, the data lake to feel more like a data warehouse. Um, not providing the engine, Iceberg is not a query engine, but really focusing on the storage here of a data lake and giving the correctness and SQL-like behavior that you would expect um, in that environment. And then, you know, improving on things like schema evolution, obviously very important for change data capture, uh, because if you can't evolve the schema, um, you're not going to be able to, to reflect your um, source database upstream. Uh, being able to manage partitioning is critical for making change data capture processing um, performant, but also uh, allow your queries to, to run fast. Time travel rollback, which are actually huge in these worlds where, you know, some some data comes downstream that you want to roll back, you can now do so and reprocess. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. And then data compaction for, you know, ensuring that your, your storage is efficient and um, small, so you know, easy to query and not taking up as much storage as uh, it would be if you weren't doing efficient compaction. And then, you know, Iceberg has a REST catalog specification, and this allows for a lot of important capabilities such as multi-table commits and write deconfliction and having a single point to to access your your Iceberg data. So there's a bunch of things that you have to think about when doing CDC. Um, and I'm going to start with talking about those before I hand it off to Jason to talk about what we do at Tabular to solve some of these considerations. Um, the core thing that most people do with change data capture when it comes to a data leg is you know, mirroring the source table. So as transactions and operations happen on your relational databases, one to many, it could be a sharded database, it could be you know, a, a fleet of different databases for different data domains, whatever that is, you want to be able to query it in your analytical environment. 
um, query federation doesn't really work because those systems are designed for operational queries. Putting the load of an analytical query on them is not not good for their performance or for their scaling. Um, so we need to capture the changes that happen in those upstream databases. We also want to be thinking about, you know, how do we get end in late see down. Um, doing a daily snapshot is great um, if you don't care about the data that's happened or the things that have happened across the organization within the day. Um, so being able to reduce that latency to minutes instead of hours or days, uh, you know, can have huge business impact. There are some challenges. Uh, transactional consistency probably being the hardest, um, but just correctness, right? We don't want duplicates. We don't want um, messages and events to be processed out of order. All these things are are you know, challenging to do yourself when it comes to change data capture. And then, you know, what kind of approach do you want to take? Um, do you want to try to do upserts um, like you would to an operational database? There are ways to do that with Iceberg. Um, or do you want to use the change log approach? And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. What, what are the advantage of the change log approach? It is our, our preferred approach at Tabular that we do for our customers. But, um, you know, we'll talk about kind of the pros and cons of using that uh, change log approach. And what I mean by the change log approach is instead of writing directly to a mirrored table in your analytical environment, you actually capture the, the individual inserts, updates, and deletes that come from your, your CDC pattern. And you apply those to a different table. So you kind of have two tables in Iceberg, one that has all of those individual events and you keep those long-term and you can do a lot with them. You can replay them. You can uh, roll them back if you know bad data was sent downstream, all that kind of stuff. And then another table that's the mirror, um, which then gets updated and merged into over time. So a CDC event or a change capture event has a certain anatomy. Um, it has, you know, an operation code that's an insert and update or a delete. Um, so we know what it is. Um, you know, these aren't raw events per se. They're actual database operations that occur upstream. Um, it's also going to have some sort of transactional ID. This might be something simple like a timestamp. Timestamps aren't the best. We can work with them, and there are solutions for them. But timestamps have granularity problems, which is you could still have two events in the same millisecond on the same object. Um, but getting the ID from the source database is really important. Then you have ordering within a transaction. So you know if you do want to think about multi-table commits or the way things need to be applied, um, you do need ordering to be able to unwind those and ensure that the downstream databases are updated in the correct synchronization. And then you have two kinds of data in the, the message. You could have a partial row, so what was updated plus the key. You might have the full row with all the data, even if even including fields that uh, had not been not been changed. Upstream, there's a couple of different tools. So most tools that are effective at doing change data capture don't query the source database. The goal of a proper change data capture feed is to ensure that we're not putting transactional load on the source database. So how do we do that? Well, we read from the, the durability of that database or the redo log, it has a hundred names. It can be a bin log, a redo log and so forth. But the idea is every relational database um, and some non-relational databases have something that you can read to replay the events that have occurred in that database. And there's a couple of core tools that we're going to focus on. Um, there's others out there, so don't think you have to use um, the two that I talk about in detail, um, but these are the two that we see the most in, in the modern data stack. Um, the first one is Debezium. Uh, Debezium is started out as a Kafka connector. It has kind of evolved to be that and more. Um, so, and its support of different databases has evolved over time, but it, it has the technology to read from a bunch of different um, source bin logs and redo logs and so forth and emit those changes. Um, most people use it as a Kafka source connector writing to a Kafka stream. Um, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of using a stream versus files later, but uh, it, it's commonly used and it's open source. So there's no, no cost of using it to be the other than the infrastructure to run it. The next one that we see a lot of, uh, particularly in the AWS ecosystem, is their database migration service, um, or DMS. DMS is uh, you know, a managed service that you can run within AWS to capture changes. It kind of has two modes. Um, one is write to a stream. This could be Kafka or Kinesis or other stream. Um, usually we see it used with Kafka. 
Um, it also can write directly to your storage, such as S3, um, so that you don't have to have a streaming infrastructure to, to use DMS. And then there's other, other CDC tools out there. There's long tail. Um, the most popular other two I see are, are Click, which used to be uh, Attunity, um, and Oracle's Golden Gate product, which are both change data capture tools that are common in the world. And then there's you know, probably a dozen you know, less common CDC tools. The idea is they all have the same purpose, which is to capture these change events so that they can be consumed downstream. There's kind of two technological topologies that are common for doing CDC. Um, one is, you know, having your tool write directly to um, your object storage. So writing to S3 or other uh, cloud storage is pretty common. Um, the other is to have a stream. Um, that could be a Kinesis or Kafka or Pulsar or other streaming technology. Um, we see both um, pretty commonly. For the streaming, the pros are you can tune it. Um, so with the stream, you can have um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of control over how often you commit to Iceberg, which allows you to tune your your end-to-end -end latency um, very in a very fine-grained detail. It's also low code if you use Kafka Connect. We'll talk about Kafka Connect with Iceberg here in a minute. Um, but you're able to, you know, land the data into an Iceberg table without any code out of a stream. It's also very easy to detect and create new tables because it does provide, if especially in the Kafka world, although with Blue Schema Registry, you can do it for Kinesis too, you have the ability to define schemas on messages. And schemas are pretty important when it comes to change data capture. We, we kind of need that information. The con is infrastructure. Uh, you need a stream. Um, so, you know, it does cost a little bit more to run a streaming ingestion with. Another pro I forgot to put on here is that uh, you can fan out, right? So if your change data capture is going to multiple destinations, like your your operational databases and NoSQL, like a Dynamo or Cassandra, um, and your, your lake, then having a stream is nice because they play off the same feed. They're not having to build point solutions for each target. On the file load side, um, you know, we have things like DMS that can write directly to S3. Um, no additional infrastructure required for that, right? It doesn't need that stream storage or stream persistent to be able to write to uh, to the, uh, the that environment. Downside, is, especially today, is most of these tools don't write directly to Iceberg format. I think that's something that will happen long term, but as of today, they don't. Um, so you would have to use something like a, a tabular file loader or a Spark job that you write or other um, capability to load that data into Iceberg for the, the first time. And the other is whenever we're dealing with, with files is we're, you know, we're probably going to have higher latency, right? And we're not going to have the ability to tune our stream down to like minute level latency and things like that. So a huge issue for analytical environments, we find that most folks are just looking for, for the... Um, the uh, you know minute level latency and so forth. I, I did notice a hand raised. Um, so I'd say for questions, we're going to take them at the end. Um, if you go into Q and A within Zoom, you should be able to register your question, and we'll we'll get to those soon. So in the Kafka world, uh, one thing that we at Tabular has contributed to the open source uh, ecosystem around Iceberg and um, change data capture, particularly is a Kafka sync connector. So if you do capture your change events in a streaming environment such as Kafka, we make it very easy to parse those and get them downstream into, uh, into Iceberg. And this handles a lot of the, the bigger challenges of writing to an uh, analytical storage, um, such as coordinating commits across a distributed worker fleet. Um, you want to ingest data extremely high volume, you kind of want the partitions from Kafka and the different uh, workers to commit at the same time. So we don't have things that are ahead of other parts of our data set. Um, it has exactly once delivery semantics, which combined with idempotence on the producer side can ensure a much better um, uh, situation when it comes to duplicates um, in your environment. Since Kafka's default modes are at least once processing, exactly once semantics allow us to process those in a, in a more coherent way. Um, it handles multi-table fan out. So if you want to have multiple different uh, things downstream, you can. Uh, it also has an upsert mode, and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of upsert mode um, 
here. Um, our tabular approach is going to be in the change log mode, but you can do upsert mode for low volume tables where you just want to do iceberg upserts um, and uh, not have to deal with the, the merge processing pattern that we'll talk about in a bit. It does a lot of cool things like uh, message conversion. So it can use the iceberg schema as the source of truth, or actually, I should update this, it can now use a schema registry as the source of truth for for um, you know managing schema in this environment. For change data capture, it's pretty common to have, say, the Confluent schema registry or the Glue schema registry source um, information, uh, and then serialize messages in Protobuf and Avro and other serialization formats. Um, so the Kafka connector is able to process all those different formats and then evolve the iceberg tables downstream to match. It can even create new tables in Iceberg. So if you have change data capture set up to detect new tables upstream, you can actually have an end-to-end -end propagation of those tables in your analytical environment without any changes, which is really cool from a developer perspective and an operational perspective. You don't need a, a pull request for every table created upstream, which in a large organization with lots of dev teams can be extremely challenging. The other thing that's of note in this connector that's probably relevant um, for change data capture is it has two embedded um, transformers. Uh, one is for DMS messages, the other is for Debezium formatted messages. And what this lets you do is not have to write anything custom to handle the metadata required in those in those environments so that you can you know, parse out the event, the insert, update, or delete operation, as well as the, um, the message itself, but also get stuff like transactional IDs and uh, uh, ordering within a, within a transaction out of the message. So I talked earlier about there's a couple of different ways of doing change data capture, one of which is upserts and the other is um, the change log. So upserts are okay for low changing data, but they still have some, some downsides. Um, performance is really the big one. Whenever you do upserts, you're actually pushing a lot of the performance impact on your, on your consumers. Um, and you're, you're putting a lot of load uh, on whatever system is writing the iceberg. So, the change log approach is what we generally recommend. It's not a uh, solve all, but for a vast majority of use cases, we like the change log approach. Why? Well, it's simple. <laughs> you, you only have to append to Iceberg. You're not trying to, to update anything at rest and you're not writing lots of different delete files and other things you would do in, a, in some other patterns. It's accurate history. Um, so having a change log is really important. If you don't store your data in Kafka, for all time, then you need a change log to be able to replay things or to, to be immune to problems like double updates and so forth. And you can read some of our blogs in the tabular website if you want to dig deeper into the, the as our founder Ryan would say, the data gremlins um, of the CDC land. But uh, having the history of all the changes really allows you to unwind problems and you know correct issues that you see downstream. Um, it really creates an ideal source for streaming changes. So you could actually feed this change log back into like a Flink job or other stream processing framework um, to be able to reprocess stuff um, or to train a machine learning algorithm or any of the things where a, a change stream is useful and you don't want to put load on your operational stream to do so. And then you can time travel. So if you uh, want to you know, filter based on when something was changed, you actually can ignore newer changes and go back in time and then rebuild a table from that that change log. So it really allows you to, to reconstruct exactly the state of a table at a specific point in time. So the, I just wanted to st finish my piece of the, the intro here with kind of a reference uh, change to the capture pattern that we do with Tabular before I hand it over to Jason to talk about the, the more low level details of what we do in a Tabular environment. But this is a lot of what I've already been talking about. Um, you have your source systems, your, your Debezium or DMS reading from the databases upstream. And I listed out all the different technologies they can talk to. They write to Kafka. Um, you have Kafka Connect running. This could be self-managed. Um, you know, roadmap for tabular in the future to manage it um, and uh, also be in the uh, in any of the managed Kafka Connect frameworks where you can bring your own connector to them. Um, and this allows you to deploy a distributed set of workers to consume from Kafka, process the change events and parse them correctly and then write them downstream. That connector is responsible for two things. Um, the first is 
evolving the schema that goes into the, the implementation of a REST catalog um, on the tabular side. The other is to commit. So write to that change log um, table in the in the iceberg environment, which are iceberg files um, at disk. And then at tabular, we take care of the, the merge to the mirror tables downstream, which we'll give way more detail on after the, the handoff here. The beauty of this is, is um, it's a very, it's a totally hands-off uh, code-free approach that allows you to um, expose all this data uh, that comes in from all these different source systems across all your different analytical tools, right? So your Trinos, your Athenas, your Sparks, your BigQueries, your Snowflakes, your whatever engine supports Iceberg, which is an ever-growing list of, of things such as Star Rocks and Puppy Graph and a hundred others, it feels like. Um, so this is kind of what the architecture looks like from, a, from an overall perspective when you do it with us. Obviously, you're able to do this, these last pieces, um, you know, yourself, but at that point, we've really optimized it. And I'm going to hand it to Jason to talk about those optimizations and, and what we're doing under the covers to make uh, change data capture very efficient and uh, performant. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I also got word that apparently the Q&A function isn't fully enabled. So I apologize if you're trying to put questions in there. Uh, if you're unable to do that, just hold till the end. We will we will leave time and um, we'll like just do raise of hands and I'll let folks chime in and, and get their questions in. And in the meantime, we'll Cliff will see if we can get that un unblocked. It should be um, unblocked. So, now. I apologize. I didn't realize I had to turn that on uh, manually. Right. But I think attendees can submit questions. Okay. Cool. Oh yeah, it's working out. Awesome. Very good. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Cliff, for that great background. And yeah, now uh, I'm going to just talk specifically about uh, how Tabular makes doing this whole uh, change data capture from your transactional systems into your uh, into your lake really, really efficient. And like you said, no code, hands off, and, and highly optimized. So first things to understand, it is a fully managed kind of offering. There's no infrastructure that you have to run. Uh, once you get your data in into that, uh, that first change log table. So um, and actually, in, in some cases, if you're using files, Tabular can absolutely do the, the file load portion for you. So once you've got data into that changelog iceberg table, uh, merging that into a, a downstream target table is all just declarative so declarative data engineering, as we like to say at Tabular, which is uh, a nice low ops way to get this stuff done. Um, if you're familiar with you know, iceberg and, and other table formats, that do record level uh, operations like, like it's necessary for, for handling CDC, then you are, may also be familiar with the two styles of how that can happen. That can be um, copy on write, meaning every time that we need to update any record in a file, uh, one or more records in a file, we replace that entire file. Um, or it can be merge on read where we need to replace a record in a file. We simply just write another file that has the updated information uh, for uh, a set of records uh, in the file. And really the trade-off there is about um, how much work we want to do at write time when we're when we're updating these records and how much work we want to do at read time uh, where if we've only written the, the change files, that's certainly nice from the write perspective, but on the read side, then the readers have to then process uh, more and more files and sort of match those changes up to make sure you're getting accurate data. Um, now, Iceberg handles the internals of both of those mechanisms, so you don't have to really understand the details outside of just configuring your writers and your readers to use one style or the other, uh, and then life is good. Uh, and then what Tabular's uh, automated uh, system will do is really uh, hyper-optimize that choice. I think it's difficult to understand you know, which one of those you want to use, and, and we sort of just, um, based on a bunch of things that, that we understand about the patterns of your, of your change log, We'll, we'll pick the one that's going to be the most efficient for your readers and writers. Um, so yeah, the first thing to do to, to, to set this up in tabular land is to create a change event table. So as, as uh, Cliff mentioned, our approach to doing CDC uh, for iceberg tables is to first materialize all the change events from your upstream table into an iceberg table. Um, that's got some, some nice properties because that's always going to be an append only situation. So it's, you can insert those records uh, very quickly, very low latencies. And even if you're inserting lots of small files, if you're doing it in tabular, tabular will come back through and optimize and compact and sort and make, make that change event table very performant. Uh, you don't have to really worry about it when you're just getting data in. So that can come from a stream, that can come from file loads. 
Uh, really, it's just getting the data in there at whatever cadence that you want to. Um, and then, you know, we our system requires that you have a couple of things in that table. You have to have some sort of column which represents the operation, like that Cliff talked about, so that our our system knows what to do with with incoming records. And you also need to have some ordering. Like, how do we know the order of these change events that we need to replay into your target table? That can be a timestamp. Uh, better to be like a transaction ID that Cliff mentioned where there's there's less chance of conflict. Uh, we also have a couple of recommendations for that table just for performance, which is partition based on that that ordering, whether it be transaction ID or, or timestamp, um, and and using either something like Kafka Connect or or Tabular's file loader to to get data from your your change log into that iceberg table. Okay, um, this is an example here of, of one. I'm, I'm actually show a demo, and this will be similar to what I, sh I show in the demo. Um, the next piece that that you need to set up in in Tabular is to actually set up your target table. So this should look exactly like your change event table minus that operational column or an operational metadata. So this this really should be the exact schema that matches your upstream table. Once you've got it all set up, uh, Tabular will handle all the schema evolution automatically, so you don't have to worry about schema evolution once you get it set up. So you just get it set up, and then turn it on, and from then on, anything that happens in the upstream table, including adding columns, changing, you know, evolving types, all that schema evolution will happen automatically. It's a big lift. That's something that you don't have to think about and that can be tricky to get right. Uh, and coordinating schema evolution with, with inserts to the table. Uh, the other thing that we need in that downstream table is we need to know what the, what the, what sort of the primary key of that table is. In, in Iceberg, there's a concept called the identifier fields, the row identifier fields. And you can just set that iceberg property, and uh, and tabular system will use that to uh, make that the key that we, we merge new records on. Okay, next one, Cliff. Cool. And so I think the maybe the one of the best parts about how this works in tabular is how simple it is. Um, you know, our tagline is sort of data made simple. This would be change data capture made simple, in the sense that all you have to do in order to to get this up and running is set five or four uh, table properties on your change event table and your, your target table. So on the change event table side, what you're going to do is set an iceberg table property that's your dependent table. What is the target table that we're going to be taking these change events and merging into? That could be actually one or more. You could potentially have multiple copies of that um, for different reasons. Maybe they're, maybe they're partitioned differently. Maybe they're sorted differently for different analytical use cases and performance reasons. Um, and then you've got on the target table side, you're going to have um, uh, what is the op column, what is the the ordering column, like the that we can sort the in change events by, and then you can optionally set a target lag um, to to tell Tabular how frequently, how aggressively do you want us to take the change events and and push them into the the target table. Um, you know, typically you want to go as, as fast as possible, but that also has, that has cost implications ultimately. So you have a really easy way to tune. Um, do you want this to go as fast as possible or do you want to, uh, for less, less cost, do it hourly or every 20 minutes, right? So a really simple way to control that just through, through table properties. And these are just iceberg table properties. So you can, you, you can set this up using, obviously I'm going to show the, the tabular UI. But you can use anything that interacts with Iceberg table properties. So you could use Python, the PyIceberg library. You could use Spark uh, or any other engines that allow you to set Iceberg table properties. Uh, and then you can configure this stuff. So you can make it very, um, very declarative. Lots of our, our customers basically set this up as an infrastructure as code. And they've got you know, all this stuff automated to set this up in their, in their tabular warehouses. All right. Next one. Cool. Demo time. Cross our fingers and hope that the demo gods are with us today. Uh, Cliff, I think you're going to have to stop. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let me get this. All right. This is the tabular UI. And I'm going to show these two tables that we just talked about and, and how simple this is to set up. So this is our change event table. This actually is set up to have uh, loading files from S3 that are being uh, placed there by the AWS DMS. Here's an example of using the database migration service from, from AWS. We've configured DMS to push the change logs onto S3 as, as files, as Parquet files. And on the tabular side, we've got our iceberg table here. 
This is the schema of our upstream transactional table. I think it's a MySQL table. And it's got this opcode, which is how DMS represents uh, inserts, updates, and deletes. And if I peek over here at our table settings for this table, we're gonna see a couple of things. First of all, we're gonna see that we've got the file loader enabled. This is just a, another nice service from Tabular that allows you to easily get files from some path in S3 into your iceberg table. So here's the S3 path where DMS is dropping those change event logs and Tabular is just picking those up and inserting them into our, into our iceberg table. The second piece that we're gonna look at is this dependent tables property. So we talked about this. Uh, this is just setting, hey, what are the downstream tables that we're gonna merge the change events into? In this case, we've got uh, multiple set up here, but this can be a singular table most often is. All right, so that's the, the setup on the change event side. And then if we look at the activity log here in, in Tabular, we'll see that um, we've got these file loaders. This is the file loader, you know, picking up files off that S3 location and just loading them into our table. Flipping over to the target table, this is where the merged version, this is the copy of our transactional table now. Uh, we see it has the same exact schema minus that operational column. Um, and if we look at its settings, I just see the same things that we talked about. We've got um, we've got our our ID column. We've got our last updated column, and we we've told uh, Tabular that this is a, meant to be a CDC. In this case, we've got a a sixty minute target lag setup. So we're going to update this table hourly. We're going to take all the changes that have been the, the the changes are loading to that that change event table constantly. But every hour, we're going to take a batch of them, merge those into uh, into this table. And if we look at our activity log here, we'll see uh, on this hourly cadence, we've got CDC jobs running, uh, updating our data, uh, replacing records, doing running all our updates. Uh, and then and then it succeeded 30 minutes ago. And we sort of see that hourly cadence happening here. So that's what that looks like in Tabular. And again, you can set all that up through any APIs, uh, that's, or you can use, or use the UI to do it. And once you've got that set up and running, it's completely hands off. Uh, we've got uh, open metrics endpoints for hooking up your observability tools, so you can easily monitor what's the what's the lag on these tables, how frequently are they being updated, how many updates are happening. You can set up your alerting and sort of um, monitor those those pipelines, right? Which is a key thing for making sure that um, this data is coming in and it's fresh and it's meeting your your needs. I'm going to stop sharing, Cliff. We can hop back to our slides. Cool. And this just to talk through in words, like how this actually works on the tabular side now that we've, we've seen the setup. Every time there's a, a commit to that change event table, then that's going to queue up one of these CDC merge jobs. Again, that, that's running entirely on tabular's infrastructure. There's, there's no servers or infrastructure for our customers to run. Um, a merge job will, will then kick off, provided there isn't one already in progress. So we're always running one of these things at a time. You can get uh, really strange outcomes. If you're trying to do multiple merges, like CDC style merges simultaneously, you can do concurrent writes to iceberg tables just for this pattern. Uh, it's it's not recommended. So we do this sort of like FIFO style uh, merge jobs, and um, and then the target lag. So as long as you know we've passed our target lag threshold and there's been a change to the upstream table, we will we will run this job and and update the downstream table. We take that we do an incremental read from that upstream table, right? So we're not having to read the entire change history every time. We keep a uh, we keep a marker for you know where's the last point that we read from uh, from the source table. We pick up just the changes uh, using just using icebergs incremental uh, consumption patterns uh, you know based on these snapshots snapshots and, and iceberg rolling forward, and we take up the latest set of change events, uh, run you know merge operations which are uh, available in in iceberg in, in engines like Spark and Trino and others, and and do that merge to our target table. Uh, and then we handle the scheme evolution. So if we recognize uh, each time we run one of these merge jobs, we check to see if the target or the, the upstream table schema has evolved. If it has, then we will uh, first apply those the schema changes to the target table and then and then run the merge. So schema evolution is completely handled uh, automatically. And there's a lot of other nice operational properties here about how this sets up. We, we didn't talk a lot of the details, but let's assume for, for, so for any reason, um, some bad 
data was loaded or, or change events um, got out of order or something like this. Because of Iceberg's time travel capabilities and the way that the system sets up using table properties, all you have to do is, is roll back either the, the merge table or the snap or the change event table to a, a known good state. And the system will automatically pick up and, and rerun from that state and do an item potent merge back and you, you're back into a healthy state uh, right away. So it's really simple to recover even if your data goes sideways. All right, I think that's it for this one. And just thinking about, um, we're, we're already very happy with how well this system performs, how easy it is to operate, uh, but there's actually an additional work that, that we're planning in the next, uh, next few months around this feature. Uh, one of those is automated clustering optimization. So our part of the tabular platform already handles uh, optimizing every iceberg table that that's uh, that's managed by Tabular. And that includes things like, uh, how is it partitioned? How is it clustered? Uh, what are the target file sizes? What are the target row group sizes? Compression settings, so a bunch of stuff that we can do to really optimize the physical layout of your iceberg tables. And we see great results across our customer base from doing that. CDC has very special optimization considerations to make sure those merge jobs are efficient, right? The hardest part of doing merge in these systems, any of these uh, file-based analytic formats is how do I find all the files that have records that need to be touched? Whether I'm doing copy on write or merge on read, I have to go find those files. And so uh, making sure your table's laid out to make that operation efficient is something that, that you can do. And that's something that we're, we'll be automating. There's also the process of, of bootstrapping or refreshing your table. So it's, it's, it's nice if you have a change event stream from the beginning of time for your transactional table. But practically speaking, that doesn't always happen. So you're often doing a one-time dump from your transactional table, loading that up, and then playing your C, your change event stream uh, over the top of that of that sort of bootstrap. And you might want to do that at any point in time. If there's drift over time, you can sort of refresh your downstream tables. And so there are ways to achieve that today with, with this existing setup, but we're just going to make APIs to make that even, even easier to do. Um, and I mentioned today, you are sort of responsible for getting that data into the change event table. From there, you know, Iceberg or Tabular takes over. We're going to extend that capability that will go all the way to your upstream transactional table. We'll handle, you know, reading off of that um, that bin log as, as Cliff alluded to. So you don't have to run any of that infrastructure. You don't necessarily have to run Debezium or DMS or Kafka. Uh, Tabular will handle all that infrastructure and really make it a serverless situation. We're looking at adding additional sources. So today we support, you know, Debezium and DMS mostly for your, your Postgres, MySQL uh, kinds of sources, but we're like, extending that to be um, sort of uh, NoSQL style, Dynamo, Mongo, et cetera. Um, and then a couple of, um, I guess, sort of really performance, you know, advanced performance capabilities that, that we're going to be building out. One is um, if you thought about how we have this problem and or read any of Ryan Blue's blogs on this topic, which if you haven't and you're interested, I definitely encourage you to go read. Ryan Blue has a great series of, of blogs on the top of their website about CDC and Iceberg. And one of the things he talks about in that blog is the sort of ideal state is that you combine the freshest data in your change event log with the optimized, you know, merge data that you where you've already done, you know, the, the merges. And that gives you a really nice combination of super fresh data and and good performance uh, you don't ha you don't have to you can compact you can compact it at, at regular intervals and always know you have the freshest data from the change event and you and you sort of just uh, use a view to union those things together um, so with the view support that's coming on iceberg title will, will be adding that capability where you'll have this uh, automated view on top of your change event log and your and your compacted table and then the other one is um, how to efficiently interleave the merge on read and copy on write operations, right? Uh, typically, the merge on read is great for getting data and, and updates into your table, but then there's the performance penalty on the read side. And so on, on some frequency, you want to come through and compact those bleed files back into uh, optimized parquet files. And there's some nice uh, things you can, you know, tricks you can play where you can flip between the two modes as you're doing updates. And that way you sort of get this... Um, balance be between the two the two modes as you're going along in the table and so we'll be building some, some advanced capabilities there so lots more to do uh to make this this even even more valuable for our customers
All right. Q&A time. We can start at the top. Uh, first question we have is, how close to real time will this get and what trade-offs will we have for near real time? Yeah, so um, right now we typically see about a five minute end-to-end -end latency between the change is happening in your transactional database and them showing up in the compacted table uh, in your tabular warehouse. There's a bunch of steps in there that Cliff alluded to, right? You've got to get it off the change log, maybe put it into a stream, maybe put it into a file. In, in our mode, you also then put it into a, a change event table and then into a, a compacted table. If you skip that change event table, you can squeeze that latency down uh, to you know probably minute. Uh, near real time, you can do, but the trade-off is going to likely be uh, a lot of read, read performance uh, penalties. So you can you can you know use the merge on on read style updates. You can push those into your iceberg table at, at pretty low latencies in the area real time but your readers will pay some penalties. So you gotta, you, if you could do that route, you got to make sure that you've got something tabular or some other system set up to come back through and compact and optimize those, those delete files. Um, any recommendations or best practice to perform initial database migration before setting up CDC? Cliff, you want to take that one? Sure. So there's a few different patterns you can use here, right? Um, a lot of the tools such as uh, DMS and Debezium allow you to push um, kind of a snapshot style series of events um, into a stream. So that's just gonna work straight up. Um, you can obviously do an extract. Um, so, you know, do a snapshot to uh, S3 and use a file loader or, you know, a Spark job if you're using open source iceberg to, to load that information in. Um, into the the change log or to the the yeah the mirror table to get started. So there's a few different ways for doing that uh, that that bootstrap. Uh, what I generally see is you know a tool like Debezium does a really good job of just pushing the snapshot into a feed, um, and that requires that prevents you from having to have two different code paths for for that that migration, um, the, the bootstrap and then the, the startup. Um, it does have some considerations. There's certain special messages and so forth you might have to to uh, to make the connector ignore, um, but overall that's what most people do. Cool. Um, so the next question is that we mentioned the streaming approach would automatically process data for newly added source tables without any code or configuration changes, is that the case with DMS S3? Uh, no, the, that particular feature of automatically creating downstream tables is part of the Kafka Connect uh, API um, or sort of configuration approach. Um, for DMS S3, you would have to, um, DMS I think has a, has a way to set it up where you can automatically start producing files for new tables as long as it, within a database. So um, that to, you can automate that a little bit on the DMS side, but then on the iceberg tabular side, setting up the file loader would, would still be something like some API calls you would have to make to then take those files and load them into the table. You can do it API based, but it, it wouldn't be automated. So that, that is where the streaming Kafka connect approach has some advantages. Next question is, uh, are the ETL and CDC properties available on iceberg OSS or only with tabular? Yeah, so all of those table properties that drive, you know, the, the CDC, that's a that's a tabular specific service and and, and table properties. Um, you know, Iceberg is a table specification and, and format. Um, it is in an automatic ET, automated ETL tool. That, that's, you know, those types of uh, data ingestion ETL services are, are definitely things that the tabular builds on, on top. Does Iceberg Connector Tabular support Cockroach, DBs, CDC, Stream, and File Load? Um, yes, it would support that uh, because the Cockroach, DB, CDC, Stream produces an opcode and has the transaction IDs for, for ordering. Uh, my understanding is that the in order to get that requires, I think, the Enterprise Cockroach, DB. Um, the, that CDC feature is something I think that's in their Enterprise offering. But if you have that and you can produce the CDC Stream from Cockroach, then yeah, you could uh, use tabular to to replay it. 
Uh, file loader is a service, is the API available to OSS Iceberg only with tabular. Now, similarly to the, the CDC sub file load, right? That's sort of a, a data engineering, declarative data engineering, data ingestion type service. Um, that's a that's a tabular add-on. Um, not, not something that's in OSS. Uh, next question is, what about CDC of Delta events, similar functionality to Hoodie? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, like other formats like Hoodie and, and Delta would have very similar mechanics for how they uh, take a change uh, event and, and merge it into a target table. Now, in the case of um, Hoodie in particular, they would probably really favor the direct upsert approach versus having the change event table. And then and you can do that again in Iceberg as well, but I think Hoodie's requires or highly recommends that every table have a primary key and, and all updates are sort of treated as upserts into a hoodie table. But I, I think otherwise the mechanics are very simple, similar. You're going to take change event stream, you're going to find the records in the target table that need to be updated and you're either going to replace the file completely copy and write or write um, delete files, basically this merge on read approach. All three formats are are very similar in their approach to that problem, I would say. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, can you further push the Delta events for downstream ETLs? Also, maybe you don't fully understand this question. So if you wanna ask a follow-up to clarify, um, that's one of the, I think the advantages of, of having the change event log as a table, because now you have all the deltas, right? In an, in an iceberg table that you can use in any number of ways. So one way to use them is obviously is to build this, this merged target compacted table, like what Tabulous automated CDC process is doing. But there's lots of other ways you could use that, that change event table to drive any number of, of other styles of ETL and analytic uh, downstream data artifacts. So it's another reason why we sort of prefer having that, um, that change event history in an iceberg table that, that's durable um, versus in a, in a stream where uh, you, you may you may lose it if whatever the, the stream processing goes down over over time. Uh, Cliff, you got the next one. Yep. So this question is around tuning the the iceberg sync connector, um, particularly during initial um, uh, loads, which obviously have high high throughputs um, for the snapshot. Um, there's a few different tuning parameters you can use there uh, that you have to get right to, to, for this to work. Um, the first is your, your Kafka stream itself has to have uh, enough partitions to get parallelism. If you only have you know, a low number of partitions, you will run into situations where you bottleneck um, because it can only do so much per partition per second. Um, but obviously it will scale out. So if you have a bunch of workers, you have a lot of partitions in Kafka, you should be able to get a lot of parallelism out of the same connector as long as your, your message key uh, distributes well across those Kafka partitions. Other things you can do, like the question mentions, uh, you know, not seeing a file until five minutes later. Um, that is the default commit interval of the, the Kafka sync connector. This is a tunable. So if you want to commit more frequently, um, you certainly can. What ends up happening is the commits for each partition go into uh, write messages back to Kafka as part of a control topic. Um, and then the workers then process those uh, commits uh, such that they all go at the same time up to a certain time interval and offset uh, mapping. So it's important to um, understand that like there will be some delay between uh, an individual worker's commit and the, the commit being pushed as a file to the downstream system. Um, but the key thing that you can tune is the commit interval. Now, like Jason said, you know, there's not you want to think about what you're actually doing with it downstream. So if you're only processing it every, say, five, 10 minutes, um, committing every one minute isn't getting you a lot other than, um, you know, faster writes the change log, which may not have value. So tuning this uh, is just dependent on your needs and, and how often you're doing the downstream processing. And the more often you do the downstream processing, the more expensive it gets in theory, um, because you, you might have to write the same files over and over again if you're doing merge on merge on write. So a lot of tunables here. Um, you should be able to get way more than 7,000 records 
per minute, um, like in the question, like I've seen it up to hundreds of thousands or more uh, very easily. And I don't really think there's a limit on it. It really just is how much computer you're going to throw at the problem um, and how well does your data partition in Kafka. All right. Next one is, um, if I misconfigure my, my jobs, two of them are writing to the same table, output is unpredictable, uh, they compute each other may have duplicates. Is Iceberg supporting transactions that only one write is gonna take effect and the other one is ARPIN? Um, so yes, Iceberg is supporting uh, sort of optimistic concurrency and, and transactions here. Meaning that if you, let's say you were trying to run um, for, for some misconfiguration, you had two merge jobs. They were trying to update the table at the same time. Only one of those merge jobs is going to, to win in the sense that uh, the first one will, will commit and it will update the, the state of the table. And if it was a merge and it was updating some files, then those files are gonna, um, they're gonna be, they're gonna be changed in, in, the, in the newest version of the, of the table. And when the next merge goes to commit, it's gonna recognize that hey, I was trying to update a file that some other process has already updated. So this is the optimistic concurrency bit. So the first one in wins, and that second job is, is, gonna, is gonna fail because um, it tried to, to write those updates on a different state of the, of the table. So you have some protections there in Iceberg that you wouldn't have certainly like in a hive or something. Uh, next question is clarify what needs to be done to land CDC data in a change event table. We've got the Bezium storing data on S3. Do I need to use a data engine like Spark uh, to, to load those Parquet files? Uh, yep, e either that or something like Tabular's file loader. Um, some, something to take those Parquet files and, and load them into a, an iceberg table um, in order to, if you're going to use Tabular's like automated CDC. Uh, if not, you, you could write your own Spark jobs to probably read those files incrementally, and then you know do write, write the merge uh, logic to, to merge that data into a to an iceberg table. That would probably all, also work. But then there's where there's the, the you know then you got to handle, handle schema evolution. Make sure you handle schema evolution, which Tableau's file loader would also handle. We'll handle schema evolution with those source files, uh, and then they'll propagate all the way through to your target table. Uh, make sure you do incremental processing of, of that, those files in S3, so you don't. Uh, read multiple, although with the merge, it should be mostly item potent, so you're you're a little protected there. Uh, do you have a separate change event table per target table? Yeah, uh, that you do, and that's you know again to make sure that those those um, I should say that that's not necessarily true, but the schemas have to match. So you can produce multiple target tables off the same change event table, provided all those target tables have the same schema. And the reason you may want to do that, that you want the target table to be partitioned or, or ordered differently for downstream query performance or something like this. Uh, but in order for schemas to line up and schema evolution to work, the target table and, and change of a table have to have matching schemas. Uh, the change of a table can get significantly larger than the source table. And it's how they find ways to compact trim this. Yep, Tableau has lots of functionality to do that. And, and you're right, right? Like the change event table has all the history forever of all the change events that's gonna grow much more than your uh, the, the target or the, the source table. And Tabular's automated optimization and compaction services will you know, keep that change event table in a very healthy state. We also have um, automated like lifetime, data lifetime services. So you can say, I only wanna keep the last 90 days of this change events and anything over the 90 days automatically purge it Tabular will also handle handle that. So there's lots of ways to keep that table healthy. And it's, it's mostly, again, all declarative. It's all configuration-based. There's no infrastructure for you to have to run to achieve that kind of stuff. Uh, internally, do you use Spark or Flink to process CDC offense on the fly? Uh, internally, today, we are using Spark, primarily. All right, hit all the questions. We're just about at time. We'll do a last call for questions, uh, you know, give it a minute or two here. And and then uh, if we don't get any new ones, we'll sign off. There we go. <laughs> CDC table, can I still trigger to take a snapshot? Um, correct. Um, so a snapshot in an iceberg table is every time there is any commit to the table that, that represents a new snapshot. So snapshots are automatic in the sense that anytime you make a change to the table, it's gonna be a new snapshot. So in the case of these CDC tables, Every time we run one of those merges, uh, you've got a new snapshot of the table. 
So if you ever wanted to time travel and say like, well, what was the state of this table yesterday? It's a very trivial thing to do in an iceberg table. Uh, you know, a lot of patterns that we built up in, in Hive around this were to have sort of like daily snapshot copies of the table, which were like full copies of the entire table every day. So that if we wanted to see what the state of a record was, you know, last month, we would have to keep all that data around. And it was a ton of duplicate data. In iceberg tables, you just use you know, time travel and that it's built in, nothing special you have to do. So you could go back and see the state of record at any point in history. Uh, right, some more questions coming in here. Um, suggested to use change table or iceberg snapshot to do time travel query. Uh, just the iceberg time travel across snapshots will, will be, just use the built-in iceberg time travel functionality and that will work quite well. Um, you, what you, what you don't have the, the, the change table, you've got, uh, you can go to any point in time, right? Cause you've got the full change history there. If you use the iceberg snapshots for time travel, you only have the commit boundaries. So if you're only merging say every hour, then you only have hour level granularity you can time travel to. So there's, there's a trade off there. It'll be more performant because that's all compacted versus the change events. You may have to read it through a lot of change events to get to that state that you wanted. So you, Again, nice to have uh, the capability to do both is really you know, why we have the two tables. It's good because we can use both. Uh, if I use file loader to load parquet files, does the, does the file need to conform to a certain schema? Um, the file loader will handle schema evolution. So not necessarily, it's optional. You can turn it on or off depending on if you want it to automatically evolve the schema. If you have it off, then the parquet files need to match the target table Although it's it's a little bit lenient in the sense that if you have missing call fields, it'll fill nulls. And if you have added fields, it will ignore them if you've got schema evolution off. So, uh, but if you have a field that's like the wrong type or something, it, it won't load and it will fail. Not directly related, can we share tabular general map? General roadmap. Um, my general roadmap is to continue to make data easy, data simple. Uh, so obviously leveraging the capabilities of Iceberg as a table format to do all the great things that Iceberg can do and, and continue to add these um, sort of declarative data engineering uh, types of, of features where our customers don't have to uh, run infrastructure, don't have to have big data teams with a lot of sophisticated uh, orchestrated Spark jobs to achieve uh, what they want to achieve. You know, optimal tables in an open format in your data lake uh, and you know, being able to do simple things like CDC, uh, SCD type one, type two dimensions, uh, deduplication, uh, ingestion from other sources. These are all the common patterns that we see that uh, there's really no specific business logic around them and there are things that's have to economic in that platform. So we'll continue to do that sort of stuff. And I'm glad you're a fan. Thank you, it's great. Uh, run up on time, I'll take this last, these last two. How's billing applied for the various managed CDC components? Uh, yep, great question. Pricing is available, tabular.io slash pricing. It's based on the amount of data read. Uh, that most of our services operate that way. Uh, we find it to be more predictable because you're not buying compute units from us, right? It's, there's no infrastructure you're running. And so it's more like how Athena uh, operates where it's amount of data that you, re that you read, that our services read, and that's how we do usage-based pricing. And this is why running the CDC jobs more often will be more expensive because you're just going to read more data. Um, but happy to have a con deeper conversation. Reach out to <laughs> reach out to us if you want to talk about about pricing. Uh, all right. And then, uh, how is it the CDC stream provision across Kafka partitions? How is transaction consistency and ordering maintained in this case? Uh, Cliff, that's actually a pretty involved one. I know we're at time. Do you want to try and take a stab at it? Yeah. So um, that's configuration to Bezium. Um, you can. Uh, pick how what the message key should be based on the source schema. And when you configure to Beesim, it'll make some assumptions by default, but um, this is configurable upstream. Uh, same for like DMS and so forth. You, you have to configure what the message key is in, in Kafka. And then, you know, for the default uh, partitioning in Kafka, it's going to take that message key, do a hash, and then assign it to a partition, partition based on that hash. Um, in terms of transactional consistency and ordering is, well, for one, within a partition of Kafka, obviously ordering is guaranteed. That's one of Kafka's guarantees. 
Um, but it's not all that important actually, because we do capture the transaction ID and other metadata from the source system. And that's what we use when we do the merge downstream um, in tabular land. So as those data hit the change log, when we we pick them up, we use that transaction ID to ensure that, you know, a message that was say late arriving doesn't get applied out of order um, if the downstream system has been updated since that happened. Um, so we keep track of that timestamp and that protects us against that problem or that transaction ID. Transaction ID is better than timestamp um, because of, you know, granularity issues, but um, either can, can help with that problem. Yep. And we, one of the things I didn't mention on the roadmap is, is multi-table transaction consistency, uh, which is something we're excited about unlocking where and the reality is in your upstream transactional table, uh, you know, you have you updating multiple tables at once. It's very difficult to represent that in your analytics space, but with iceberg and the rest catalog, you know, we can do that now. And so we're excited about that feature as well. Yep. And we have all the data required to do. It's just a matter of uh, building the orchestration to ensure that they commit at the same time to the, the multiple target tables. Um, so I think that's it for questions. Uh, I very much appreciate and we very much appreciate everyone attending today. Uh, thank you for the great questions and uh, hope that this was helpful in your journey to building an iceberg based lake and uh, achieving change data capture feeds into it. Uh, uh, we're always here at, at Tabular to help with questions, both on the, the Apache Iceberg Slack, which you can find on the official Iceberg website, but also if you have Tabular-related questions or want to work with us, uh, please reach out and we'd be happy to help. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Cliff. Thanks, all.